welcome. Let's look at the anatomy of the lungs. The lung is a principal organ for respiration. The lungs are paired. That means we have one on the right and one on the left. It's a spongy elastic organ that is able to expand so as to allow inflow of hair into it. It is about 1.3 kg in weight. And we have each of the lungs connected to the bifurcation of the trachea. This is the trachea, and this is where it bifurcates into the right principal bronchus and the left principal bronchus, so that they will be able to feed individual lungs with hair. So air is now being absorbed into the blood, and that is being distributed to the remaining part of the blood. On the gross view, the lung is pinkish red in color, and that is seen in healthy subjects. In smokers, it tends to be dark because of the smoke that is being inhaled. It is conical in shape, which means that it has an apex, and this is the apex and the base. And this is the way it stands in the human body. We have the apex pointing upward, and we have the base directed downward. This is how it is placed on both sides of the heart. So the apex of the lungs also extend above the clavicle. This is the clavicle on the right hand. This is the clavicle on the left. So you have the apex of the lungs extending above the clavicle. The lungs, we've already said, going through our previous slide, that it is located on both sides of the heart. This is the heart at the center. And we have the lungs located one on each side of the heart. And the lungs cannot be located too far from the heart because of the pulmonary circulation. So it is expected that they are located very close to the heart. By the time we go through with this lecture, we'll see what the pulmonary circulation is and we'll be able to justify the reason why the lungs is located close to the heart. So it is located one each on the lateral side of the heart. And all this structure are embedded within the thoracic cavity. So this is the thoracic cavity and below it is the abdominal cavity. Partitioning or dividing the thoracic cavity and the abdominal cavity is, is the diaphragm. And this is the diaphragm highlighted in black. So it's like a structure that helps to hold the thoracic organ in place and also helps to divide the thoracic cavity from the abdominal cavity. So the lungs is located in thoracic cavity each on both sides of the heart. And where the heart is located is called the mediastinum. So this region is the mediastinum. We said that the lung is responsible for oxygenation of blood, which means that it helps to add oxygen to blood. But how does the lung carry out this function? So let's go through this. This is the lungs, one on one side, and this is the heart. On the heart, we know that the heart is divided into two by septum. So we have deoxygenated blood on the right side, and we have oxygenated blood on the left side. This is the right atrium, this is the right ventricle, and this is the left atrium, this is the left ventricle. So the heart is also further divided on each side into two. So we have an upper compartment and we have the lower compartment. So the heart is divided into four, but dividing it into halves, we have deoxygenated blood on the right side and we have oxygenated blood on the left side. So what happens is that the deoxygenated blood on the right side moves from the right atrium and it is being pushed down into the right ventricle. When it gets to the right ventricle, it is being directed to the lungs because it is deoxygenated and it needs to be oxygenated. And the vessel that carries this is the pulmonary artery. We know that arteries generally carry oxygenated blood except the pulmonary artery and that is why the exception is. It is an artery because it is supplying the lungs but instead of carrying oxygenated blood in this regard it is carrying deoxygenated blood. We already said that the oxygenated blood is seen in the right part of the heart so it runs from the right ventricle to the lungs. When the pulmonary artery takes the deoxygenated blood into the lungs, when it gets into the lungs, we already have oxygen being supplied into the alveoli. If you go through our lecture on the respiratory tree, we see that the trachea continuously divides downwards until when it gets to the final termination point, which is the alveoli. And the alveoli is at the point where this exchange occurs. You can go and view the lecture on the respiratory tree to get adequate knowledge in this regard. So we already have hair being taken into the lungs and the blood that is taken in by the pulmonary artery is deoxygenated blood. So there's going to be exchange. Air is going to be taken in into the blood. Now we have oxygenated blood. So the oxygenated blood will then be taken out of the lungs through the pulmonary vein. We also know that veins generally 
carry deoxygenated blood, except the pulmonary vein that carries oxygenated blood. And this is where the exception is. So we have the pulmonary vein now carrying oxygenated blood, but it is now taking it back into the heart. Remember that the deoxygenated blood that was carried by the pulmonary artery is also from the heart. This will also be taken back to the heart because where they receive it from is from the heart. So it takes it back into the heart, but it now takes it to the left part of the heart. We already said that the left part of the heart is seen with oxygenated blood. Empty it into the left atrium. From the left atrium, it goes to the left ventricle. From the left ventricle, the greatest artery in the body, which is known as the hiatal, will pick it up and take it to the remaining part of the body to feed the body tissue with oxygen so that they can use it to carry out their metabolic activity. After the body tissues have taken the oxygen that they require and nutrients, the remaining blood that is deoxygenated will now be carried by the veins of the different organs or the different regions in the body, and it will be emptied into the vena cava. The upper part will be emptied into the superior vena, vena cava, why the lower part will be emptied into inferior vena cava. The superior and the inferior vena cava will join to form the vena cava, and this is the largest vein in the body. So from the vena cava, we already know that on the right part of the heart, we have deoxygenated blood, and this is the only place where they will be emptying the blood into. So from the vena cava, the deoxygenated blood will now be emptied into the right atrium. From the right atrium, it goes to the right ventricle. From the right ventricle, the pulmonary artery will take it from there and empty it into the lungs where it will receive oxygen. The blood that is now oxygenated will be taken by the pulmonary vein. Pulmonary vein will take it to the left part of the heart, specifically the left atrium. From the left atrium to the left ventricle, the heart picks it up again. That is how it runs throughout. And that the lungs and the heart present in terms of blood oxygenation. You can now see the reason why the lungs needs to be located close to the heart. You can see that this is very interesting to learn. Talking about the surfaces of the lungs, the lungs has three surfaces. And the first one is the coastal surface. Coastal means ribs. It means that the surface of the lungs that is related to the ribs. So we have the ribs running like that on both sides, forming the thoracic cage. So we have surface that is related to the ribs. So the ribs run across the surface from anterior to behind, and that is the coastal surface. This surface takes the bulk of the surface of the lungs. In the next surface is the diaphragmatic surface from the word diaphragm. We know that the diaphragm separates the thorax from the abdomen. So we have the diaphragm below forming the inferior border of the thoracic cavity, and it is onto this that the lungs rest upon. So the surface of the lungs that is related to the diaphragm is called the diaphragmatic surface. Then we have the mediastinal surface. The mediastinal surface, we already said that the heart is located in the center, and this space is called the mediastinum. So the surface of the lung that is related to the mediastinum is called the mediastinal surface. So we have three surfaces, the coastal, the diaphragmatic surface, and the mediastinal surface. And each of these surfaces have their own distinct presentation, and that we'll see as we go through with this lecture. The eye lung. If you look at the mediastinal surface, we already said that the mediastinal surface is somewhere around here. There's an impression. Okay, let's use the left lung to show this impression. This is like a depression that is seen on the mediastinal surface. And this depression is called the high lung. This depression is to create allowance or space for structure to enter into the lungs and also exit the lung. Structures will be going into the lung because we said that hair will be taken into the lungs the hair will be used to oxygenate blood, and the oxygenated blood will also be taken out before it's finally distributed to the different regions of the body. So this means that structures need to be carried into the lungs, and also structures need to exit the lungs. So this is the eye lung. Then we have the root. The roots are a collection of structures that enter the lungs and also leave the lungs. The structures that form the roof of the lungs, they pass through the hilum because the hilum already creates the impression for the structures to enter into the lungs. So let's look at the number of structures that form the root of the lungs, which are the collection of structures that you see passing through the hilum. So the first one is the pulmonary artery. The pulmonary artery, we already said in our previous slide that pulmonary artery carries deoxygenated blood. And the deoxygenated blood that is carrying is bringing it from the heart. 
specifically the right part of the heart because we say the right part of the heart is filled with deoxygenated blood and it carries it from the right ventricle then takes it to the lungs where it will be oxygenated so the pulmonary artery is one of the structures that forms the root of the lung. And this is the pulmonary artery, highlighted in black. This pulmonary artery, we have just one for each of the lungs. So we have one pulmonary artery on the right and one pulmonary artery on the left. Then we have the pulmonary vein. We already said that all veins carry deoxygenated blood, except the pulmonary vein that carries oxygenated blood. So after the pulmonary artery has taken deoxygenated blood into the lungs, definitely the lungs is filled with air. It's going to be oxygenated in the lungs. And this will need to be taken out so that the bloody tissue can enjoy the oxygen supply. So the pulmonary vein is what carries the oxygenated blood out of the lungs. And this is the pulmonary vein. We have two pulmonary veins for each of the lungs. That means that we have two on the right and two on the left. So they carry the blood that is oxygenated out of the lungs, but they do not take it directly to the body tissue. So they first remit it into the heart and where they'll be remitting it into is the left part of the heart because we said that the left part of the heart contains oxygenated blood. So it goes to the left atrium, from the left atrium to the left ventricle, from the left ventricle, the hiatal will pick it, then we distribute it to the body cell for their metabolic activities. Then the next structure that we see is the bronchus. This is what should have even been listed first because it is the bronchus that carries the hair that will be used to oxygenate the blood. This is the trachea at the level of the carina, which corresponds to the fourth or the fifth thoracic vertebra. The trachea bifurcates into two. And why it bifurcates at this region is to supply the two lungs with hair. And the initial state of bifurcation after the trachea is the primary bronchus. So we have the right primary bronchus and the left primary bronchus. And each of them goes to supply the lungs. There's going to be further division as we go down the tree. But for the purpose of this lecture, we we'll just limit it to the initial segment to supply the lungs. So we have the two bronchi carrying hair to supply the lungs because the hair is what the lungs need for it to oxygenate the blood. And this is the bronchus. Then we have the bronchial artery. The bronchial artery are the blood supply of the lungs. We cannot say that because the lungs helps to oxygenate blood, it also has its own tissue that it needs to feed with oxygen and nutrients because it needs to carry out its own metabolic activities too. So the lungs also has its own blood supply. After the half of aorta, we have the aorta descending downwards. So we have the thoracic aorta, we have the abdominal aorta. From the thoracic aorta, we have the emergence of the bronchial artery that gives oxygenated supply to the lungs to feed its own tissue. We already said that aorta will pick up oxygenated blood from the left ventricle. When the aorta picks it, it will cough to form the heart. From forming the heart, it will descend downwards. From where it is descending, we have the initial segment of the descending aorta, which is the thoracic aorta, gives off a branch to supply the lungs before they continue in their journey downwards to supply other body tissue. Then we have the bronchial vein. After the bronchial artery supplies oxygenated blood and nutrients to the tissue of the lungs, after they are being used up, the remaining blood is returned back through the bronchial vein, and this will finally remit it into the vena cava, which will follow the path that we discussed before. So we have the bronchial artery supplying tissue of the lungs with oxygen and nutrients. Then the deoxygenated blood after usage will be collected through the bronchial vein. Then we have the pulmonary plexus of nerve. This gives innervation to the lungs. We are also going to be dwelling more on this during the course of this lecture. We also have the bronchial lymph nodes, which helps to drain nerves, and we have areolar tissue. On this image downwards, this image shows the presentation that we have on the high lung and the structures that are being represented are structures that form the root of the lungs. We have one pulmonary artery and they are highlighted in blue. We have two pulmonary veins highlighted in red. Then we have the bronchi. 
On the right side, we have the epithelial and the epithelial bronchi. We already explained this in our lecture in the bronchial tree. Where we said that the pulmonary artery runs between the epithelial and the epithelial bronchus. And this is well presented in this image. This is the pulmonary artery. And you see the epithelial bronchus above. You see the epithelial bronchus below. The epithelial bronchus will further divide into two, finally forming three bronchi on the right to supply the three loops of the lungs. While in the left side, we said that the pulmonary artery doesn't form any demarcation between the upper and the lower bronchi. And it's also being represented here. So there's nothing like a bacteria or a bacteria bronchi on the left side. Then we have the bronchial artery. The bronchial artery that supplies the tissue of the lungs. On the right side, we have one. On the left side, we have two. And we have lymph nodes. So this is the presentation of what we have in the root of the lungs. It is also important for us to take note that the structures that form the root of the lungs connect the lungs with the heart and also the trachea. Because we say that the bronchus forms part of the root and it enters through the high lung to penetrate into the lungs, although they further divide as they go downwards, they form a kind of connection between the lungs and the trachea. And also the heart, we have the pulmonary artery and the pulmonary vein, taking deoxygenated blood and oxygenated blood to the heart. They also, in a way, connect the lungs to the Heart. So the structures that form the root of the lungs, if you look at the structural presentation, they form a connection between the lungs and the heart and also between the lungs and the trachea. So let's take note of the pulmonary ligament. We have a downward fold or extension of the visceral and the mediastinal part of the parietal pleura. These pleura are structures that surround the lungs. They are incomplete at the region of the root. So we have an extension downward, and this is the pulmonary ligament. So it's like a downward extension, and this extends down to the level of the diaphragm. And what is contained within this fold of ligament is areolar tissue. What the pulmonary ligament does is to help anchor the lungs in position. It helps to hold it in place and prevent it from twisting and folding. So relevance of the pulmonary ligament, height tends to be useful during the process of respiration, during exercise or any form of intense activity. The pulmonary ligament tends to create space for expansion for the pulmonary vein. This is the pulmonary vein painted in red. We already said that the pulmonary vein carries oxygenated blood. During exercise or any form of intense body activity, the pulmonary ligament tends to create space for the expansion of the pulmonary vein so that more oxygen will be able to reach the body cell so as to complement for the activities that the body is undergoing at that point in time. Because there is intense activity, the need for oxygen will be more and this will tend to compensate for that requirement. It tends to create more space within it so that the pulmonary vein can expand so that more oxygenated blood can be taken back into the body to feed the body cell. Also during inspiration, we know that when we inhale air, there's going to be a depression of the diaphragm. We have the diaphragm down here where the pulmonary ligament attaches on. So when there is inspiration, there's going to be a depression of the diaphragm so that the space within the thoracic cavity can be increased. And when there's depression of the diaphragm, because this is attached to it, the pulmonary ligament will also descend along with the diaphragm. And when this descends, the root will also be pulled along with it, thereby creating a space above this region for the lungs to expand. And when the lungs expand, hair will be able to gush in into the lungs. And that is what is required during inspiration to allow adequate inflow of air into the lungs. So this is what is presented. And this is the activity of the pulmonary ligament in respect to helping to support the inspiration process and also the request that is being needed during intense activity in the body, such as exercise. And you can see that it's also relevant in its own way. The hilum is the indentation that is created on the mediastinal surface of the lungs. This impression is so created for structures to be able to drive into the lungs and also exit. Why the root is a collection of structures that enters into the lungs and leave the lungs. The lungs also has three borders. 
Remember, we said that we have three surfaces. We have the coastal surface. This is the coastal surface. That is the rounded surface that is related to the thoracic cage. Then we have the mediastinal surface, which is the surface that is facing the mediastinum. And this is the mediastinal surface here. Then inferiorly, we have the diaphragmatic surface, which is the surface that is related to the diaphragm. We also have three borders. The first is the anterior border. The anterior border is where the coastal surface, which is the rounded surface, meet with the mediastinal surface, which is the surface that is facing the mediastinum. So this is the coastal surface, the rounded surface. Then we have the mediastinal surface that is facing the mediastinum. So the point where these two surfaces meet in the anterior region is the anterior border. And this is the anterior border. Then we have another border, which is called the posterior border. And this is the border where the coastal surface meets with the mediastinal surface posteriorly. And this is the posterior border. So we have the region where the coastal surface meets with the mediastinal surface anteriorly. We also have a point where they meet posteriorly. So where they meet anteriorly is the anterior border. Where they meet posteriorly is the posterior border. And the last border is the inferior border. The inferior border is from the name, is located inferiorly. So it is a point or the region where the coastal surface and the mediastinal surface meet with the diaphragmatic surface. So we have the coastal surface, we have the mediastinal surface descending downwards. So this is the way they run, this is the mediastinal surface. This is the rounded coastal surface because this is a two-dimensional image. We should imagine this roundness going posteriorly. So we have the coastal surface, the mediastinal surface descending downward. There will be a region where they will meet with the diaphragmatic surface. And the region where these two surfaces meet with the diaphragmatic surface is the inferior border. Then we have the features. The features of the lungs are two. We have the horizontal feature, and the horizontal feature, as the name applies, runs horizontally. Then we have the oblique feature. From the name, it runs obliquely, and this is the oblique feature. So these are the two types of feature that we have in the lungs. But the right and the left log are different. So let's look at the differences in terms of the features that they have. For the right lungs, we have two features. We have the horizontal feature, which we've said that it runs horizontally. This is the horizontal feature. We have the oblique feature. And this is the oblique feature. So because we have two features on the right lungs, it means that it will divide the right lungs into three lobes. So we have a superior lobe, we have a middle lobe, and we have an inferior lobe. On the left side is another scenario. So let's look through that. For the left lung, we have just one feature, and that is the oblique feature. The horizontal feature is not on the left lung. So this is the oblique feature. So because we have just one feature, we'll be having two lobes. So we have two lobes on the left lung. So we have a superior lobe and we have an inferior lobe. You can see how the features have been able to determine the number of lobes that each of the lungs will have. On the right side, we have two features, then we have three lobes. On the left side, we have just one feature and we have two lobes. The lingula is a projection that is seen around the inferior medial side of the left lung. It's only seen on the left lung. It's like a little tongue that is turned from the lower border of the left lung. So the lingula serves as the homologue of the middle lobe. So this is the lingula. So these are some facts that we should know about the lingula. The lingula is prone to collapse because of the angle of the bronchus. This is the bifurcation of the trachea, and this is the bronchus entering the lungs through the high lung. This is the lingula down below. So the angle at which the bronchus enters into the lungs, enough air may not be reaching the lingula. So they are more prone to collapse because of this. They are also more susceptible to infection because the quantity of blood that will be reaching this region will also be reduced compared to other regions because of the way they emerge below. So they will have low supply of white blood cell that would help prevent against infection. So I haven't gone through this lecture. Let's take a break here and try to evaluate the differences between the right lung and the left lung. So for the right lung, we already said that we have three loops on the right lung. And we know why, because we have two features. That's the horizontal feature and the oblique feature. For the left lung, we have two loops. And we already know why we have two loops, because we have just one feature, which is the oblique feature. Also, the right lung is heavier than the left. The right lungs 
we have three lobes, while on the left lung we have just two. So we can use that to justify. The right lung is shorter, while the left lung is longer. We said that there's a demarcation between the thoracic cavity and the abdominal cavity, and that is the diaphragm. On the diaphragm, we have a dome that is higher on the right side than on the left. So because of this dome, there's going to be a push upward. This will make it to be shorter than what we have on the left side. The right lung is also wider than the left lung. And it is wider because we said that the heart is placed between the two lungs, but the heart is not centrally placed. It is more to the left. If the heart is pushed more to the left, it means that there will be space for the right lung to occupy. And that is why it appears to be wider than what you have in the left lung. Also, on the right lung, we have one bronchial artery, while on the left lung, we have two bronchial arteries. This we have also said during the course of this lecture. The cardiac impression on the right, we expect that it will be shallow, while on the left, it is deep. We already said that the heart is located more to the left. So there's going to be a deeper impression created on the surface of the left lung because of the push. Also the base, the base of the right lung is more concave and it will be concave because of the dome of the diaphragm. There's going to be a deeper concavity on the right because of the push of the right dome of the diaphragm. Also coupled with the push from the right lobe of the liver, we have the right lobe of the liver down here and the right lobe of the liver is bigger than the left lobe. So the right lobe also further helps to push the right lung upward and this also contributes the effects produced by the right dome of the diaphragm that we say that is higher on the right than on the left. So all this put together help to increase the depression that is created in the base of the lungs. So it tends to be more concave at the base than what we see on the left side. While on the left side, the dome is not as high as what you have on the right. So the impression will not be as deep as what you have on the right. So those are the ones we've been able to establish. We can also add to this table as we may so wish. Then we have the bronchopulmonary segment. We already said that each of the lungs are further subdivided into lobes by the features. So we have superior lobe, we have the middle and we have an inferior. Here we have superior and we have inferior. Each of these lobes are further divided into bronchial pulmonary segments. And each of these segments are separated by connective tissue wrapped within their own space. So they can exist as a single functional unit of their home. This is one of the bronchial pulmonary segments of the superior lobe of the right lung. This is another broken preliminary segment of the superior lobe of the right lung. Then we have another one in that space. These bronchial preliminary segments, they tend to create a functional unit that has its own blood supply and also its own air supply. And we'll see how they do this. So we have the trachea bringing in hair from the external environment, and this tends to bifurcate to form the primary bronchus, which is the initial or the first stage of division. After when they enter into the lungs, there's going to be further subdivision into a superior and an inferior bronchi. The superior bronchus will feed the superior lobe, while the inferior bronchus will feed the inferior lobe. And at this stage of division, it's called the secondary bronchial division. And we said that each of the lobes are further subdivided into segments. So each of the secondary bronchi that is supplying each of the lobes will now further subdivide into the tertiary bronchi. Each tertiary bronchus will now go to the individual bronchial pulmonary segment. So this is how they divide from being one to dividing to the number of loops that we have, then from further dividing into the number of bronchial pulmonary segments that we have to feed each of the bronchial pulmonary segments. So that is how they have their own air supply. They also get their own blood supply from the pulmonary artery. We already said that we have one pulmonary artery on the right and we have the other one on the left. So the pulmonary artery divides into lobar artery and this further divides into the segmental and subsegmental artery, which eventually feed each of the bronchial pulmonary segments with blood. So at the end, each bronchial pulmonary segment is able to receive its own blood and also hair supply. So they tend to act as a single functional unit on their own without affecting the function of others. 
So let's take a look at the bronchopulmonary segment that we have on both the right lung and the left lung. For the right lung, we know we have three lobes. We have the superior lobe, we have the middle lobe, and we have an inferior lobe. For the superior lobe, we have three bronchopulmonary segments. We have the apical bronchopulmonary segment, and this is the apical bronchopulmonary segment. We have anterior bronchopulmonary segment that is located anteriorly, and we have the posterior bronchopulmonary segment that is located behind. So we have three bronchopulmonary segments for the superior lobe. For the middle lobe, we have two. We have medial bronchopulmonary segment, which is located medially. Then laterally, we have a lateral bronchopulmonary segment within the middle lobe. So we have two bronchopulmonary segments in the middle lobe. For the inferior lobe, we have the superior bronchopulmonary segment, which is located superiorly. Then we have anterior basal bronchopulmonary segment. Anterior basal, because it is located anteriorly and it is towards the base of the lungs. So we have the anterior basal bronchopulmonary segment. We have posterior basal bronchopulmonary segment that is located behind. We have medial basal bronchopulmonary segment, which is located medially and basal because it's towards the base of the lungs. Then we have the lateral basal bronchopulmonary segment that is located laterally. So from the name, you already know where they are located. So most of the names are being capped out from where they are located. So for the basal bronchopulmonary segments, the ones that are seen with basal, they are located towards the base. They are seen in the inferior lobe of the right lung. So let's look at what we have on the left. We have a similar pattern on the left lung, but the only difference is that we know that on the left lungs, we have just two lobes. In the left lung, we do not have a middle lobe. We only have a superior lobe and an inferior lobe. So for the superior lobe, is the same configuration that we have on the right is what we have on the left too. We have the apical, and this is the apical bronchopulmonary segment. We have anterior and posterior that is located anteriorly and posteriorly. The only addition is the inferior lingular bronchopulmonary segment and the superior lingular bronchopulmonary segment. These two bronchopulmonary segments are seen around the lingular region of the left lobe, and they tend to like replace the bronchopulmonary segment that we have in the middle lobe. So we now have a total of five bronchopulmonary segments from the superior lobe, which corresponds to the total that we have from the superior lobe of the right and the middle lobe. So if you are trying to cover the bronchopulmonary segment, just know that it is the same pattern that they follow. The only difference is that the middle lobe, having medial and lateral bronchopulmonary segment, is being replaced by the inferior and the superior lingular bronchopulmonary segment. So that is the way it plays. And for the inferior lobe, it's still the same configuration that we have in the inferior lobe of the left lung. Having a total of five bronchopulmonary segments is what you still have on the left. So we have the superior, we have the anterior basal, posterior basal, medial basal, and lateral basal bronchopulmonary segment. We already explained why they are basal, because they are located towards the base of the lungs. That is why the name is so attached to them. So that's the differences between the right lung and the left lung in terms of the division of their lobes into bronchopulmonary segments. And the significance of this is renal segmental resection. A segmentectomy can be carried out effectively without affecting the function of the other bronchopulmonary segments. Each of the segments, we say they act like a functional unit. If a bronchopulmonary segment is infected, it can actually be removed through surgery. And this will not affect the activity or the function of the other bronchopulmonary segment. It's the other bronchopulmonary segment will carry on with their function because they are functional and they have their own blood supply and hair supply. So the, the function will not be affected by whatever bronchopulmonary segment that is being removed. Then impression on the medial surface of the lungs, because we have a lot of structures that are related to the mediastinal surface of the lungs. We already said the mediastinal surface is at the medial side. So we have structures that are located at the center between the two lungs. So those structures form impression on the surface of the lungs. So we look at those impressions so that when we look at the lungs in gross or maybe in a practical section, we'll be able to indicate which structure is responsible for for the impressions that are being created. So for the cardiac impression, this we should expect to be seen more on the left because we say that the heart is more to the left. So this is the cardiac impression. It is created anterior to the root of the lungs where you have the high lung. We see the depression created in that region. And this is a cardiac depression because it is the heart that creates this depression. It is more prominent 
on the left lung. Then we have the aortic impression. This is the aortic impression. We have the aorta descending aorta, and we have the hack. They curve around the eye lung. So this is where you see the heart, then descending downwards, you see the descending aorta. The other impressions are the groove that is created by the subclavian and also groove body for the brachiocephalic. So this is the groove for the subclavian and this is the groove for the brachiocephalic vein. These are seen around the apex of the lungs. Then we have the esophageal groove anterior to the aorta. We said this is the half of the aorta and this is the descending aorta going downwards. So anterior to it, we have the groove for the esophagus. So this is the groove for the esophagus and this groove extends upward because we, we still have the cervical part of the esophagus that still goes upward. So this is a continuation of this groove. Then we have the trachea groove anterior to it, which is the groove that is created by the trachea. We have the groove for the first rib, and that crosses around the apex of the lungs. We have the thymus groove. So we have a lot of structures that tends to create impression around the mediastinal surface of the lungs. So blood supply of the lungs. The blood supply of the lungs is very interesting, and it comes in two forms. We have the systemic circulation. This systemic circulation is a circulation that fills the tissue of the lungs with oxygen and nutrients. We already said that because the lungs have to oxygenate blood, it doesn't mean that it does not also need its own blood supply. So this is the circulation that creates oxygen supply to the lung tissue. Then we have the pulmonary circulation. This is a functional type of circulation because the function that the lungs exhibit is to oxygenate blood. And it is through this pulmonary circulation that it's able to perform its function. So let's look at the systemic circulation. The oxygenated blood that is seen in the left part of the heart is taken out to be supplied to body tissue through the hiatus. This is the iota, and the iota gives blood supply to different body tissue to supply them with oxygen and nutrients. From the hack, we have the descending. From the descending iota, there is an emergence of the bronchial artery. And this is the bronchial artery that tends to supply the tissues of the lungs with oxygen and nutrients that they need for survival. So this is the systemic circulation that gives nutrients and oxygen to the lungs for metabolic activity. On the other way, we also have the pulmonary circulation, and this is done by the pulmonary artery. We also say that the pulmonary artery will also supply lungs, but what it is supplying the lungs with is deoxygenated blood, because at the oxygenated blood enter into the lungs, it will be oxygenated in the lungs. We have the systemic that supplies the lungs with oxygen, and we have the pulmonary that supplies the lungs with deoxygenated blood because it's going into the lungs to be oxygenated. You can see the disparity. We have one giving oxygenated blood because it wants to feed the tissue of the, the lungs with oxygen and nutrients. And we have the other supplying the lungs with deoxygenated blood because it wants the lungs to help oxygenate the blood so that it can take it back into the heart then to the rest of the body. So that's the way it works. Then the drainage, we also have two forms of drainage that we have for the artery because we'll be having drainage for the systemic and the pulmonary. For the systemic, the oxygenated blood is taken by the bronchial artery to feed the tissue of the lungs. After the tissue of the lungs are done using the oxygen and nutrients, the deoxygenated blood will then be taken back by the bronchial vein. So the bronchial vein on the right lung and on the left lung go through different parts, but they are finally emptied into the vena cava, which is the largest vein in the body. So they run through the normal systemic circulation from the iota down to the vena cava. But the other form of drainage, which will now be to drain oxygenated blood, you can see that it's not like the opposite of what happens in the arterial supply. Pulmonary artery carries deoxygenated blood into the lungs for it to be oxygenated. So for it to be draining, it will now be draining oxygenated blood. So the pulmonary drainage drains oxygenated blood back into the left side of the heart, where it goes to the hiatus, and the hiatus takes it to other part of the body. You can see how it plays. And this is the pulmonary vein that carries oxygenated blood back into the heart. 
Then the nerves. The innovation of the lungs is through the autonomic innovation. And we know that autonomic innovation is in two forms. We could either have sympathetic or parasympathetic. Sympathetic is during an emergency situation, while the parasympathetic is in the normal state. And this state is being innovated by different nerves. So for the sympathetic, we have the sympathetic chain, and the sympathetic chain is formed by the thoracic spinal nerve between T1 to T4, or some will say to T5. So the spinal nerve forms the sympathetic chain, and this is the sympathetic chain around this region that provides the sympathetic innervation for the lungs during an emergency situation. And what this does is to dilate the airway so that more hair can flow in and we can be able to complement with the situation at hand. But when it is in a normal state, when there is no emergency, it's going to be carried by parasympathetic innervation. And what this does is bronchial constriction. This is controlled by the vagus nerve. The vagus nerve is the 10th cranial nerve that emerges from the brain stem upward in the brain and it descends down. So, so this is the vagus nerve. So these two innervation, the sympathetic chain and the vagus nerve form pulmonary exhaust. So there's a form of anastomosis that it forms around the root of the lungs. This is the pulmonary plexus that is formed by the sympathetic chain and also the vagus nerve, so as to supply both sympathetic and parasympathetic innervation, depending on the situation that we have at hand. Then we have the lymphatic. The lymphatic drainage are also in two. We have the superficial lymphatic plexus and we have the deep lymphatic plexus. The superficial lymphatic plexus is also referred to as the subpleural plexus because it's located below the pleura. So it drains the superficial region of the lungs, while the deep plexus drains the deep region of the lungs. All this drainage are further emptied into the tracheobronchial nodes, which finally goes into the bronchomediastinal trunk. Clinical anatomy, you could have cancer, and that is where the cells of the lungs continuously divide uncontrollably. This can occur as a result of exposure to toxin or smoking. Also, family history. If someone in the family has this kind of condition, it will go down the tree. The symptoms include coughing, chest pain, and there could also be weight loss. Major treatment, it depends on the gravity, chemotherapy, Radiation therapy or surgery as the case may be. We could have asthma. This is a disorder that makes breathing very difficult and it's occurs as a result of narrowing or inflamed airway. And what is used to treat this commonly is the use of inhaler, which helps to relax or expand the airway so that more air can be able to pass through. Or we could have tuberculosis, which is also referred to as TB. This is a bacterial infection that is very contagious and it attacks the lungs. And symptoms that we see majorly is coughing, trace of blood, sneezing. The use of antibiotics for a specific number of days can be used to treat this. Pulmonary embolism. This is blockage of the pulmonary artery. We already said that the pulmonary artery carries deoxygenated blood to the lungs. When there is blockage, maybe as a result of blood clots or some other structures that could block the wall of the vessel, there's going to be accumulation of blood in the right ventricle. The right atrium to the right ventricle is where we have deoxygenated blood. And from the right ventricle is where the pulmonary artery takes the deoxygenated blood to the lung. So when there is embolism, there is blockage, there is going to be the accumulation of blood in this region of the heart because blood will refuse to leave because of the blockage. And symptoms could include difficulty in breathing. There could be chest pain during inspiration. And, and this may lead to sudden death. Um, a major treatment option could be the use of anticoagulants. So thank you for watching this video. Let's continue to stay tuned.